welcome to the um, offshore uh, wind se uh, session and Vietnam Wind Power Virtual. Um, we, the session will be moderated by Alistair Dutton, who is chair of GWEX Global Offshore Wind Task Force. We'll begin with an opening uh, presentation from Eric Yer, who is a senior advisor for the Danish Energy Agency. Um, we'll hopefully also have a presentation from Ki Hong Tran, who is senior energy specialist at the World Bank. Um, he's just having some troubles connecting, but we'll, we'll try and get him on the line as well. And then we'll move to a panel discussion um, with uh, Zee, Xi Zhang Zhang, who is Deputy General Manager of Goldwyn's Offshore Business Unit, um, Mary Thorgood, who is Senior Specialist um, Business Development for MHI Vestas Offshore Wind, um, Bernard Casey, who is Development Director for Mainstream um, Fu, Fu Kong Offshore Wind Farm, um, and then Hans Broomberg, who is Director of Business Development and Execution um, for APAC Region at WPD, and Maya Malik, who is Senior Director of Copenhagen Offshore Partners. Um, so I'll hand it off to Alistair uh, to get the session started. So over to you, Alistair. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Um, so yes, I'm Alistair Dutton, and welcome to the session which asks is Vietnam the next offshore wind market in Asia? Um, we have, an, uh, so yes, I'm chair of the Global Offshore Wind Task Force for GWEC um, and know a lot of people online who are members of that. And we have an excellent panel of experienced and knowledgeable people from the offshore wind sector, especially in Vietnam. I'm gonna invite Eric um, from the Danish Energy Agency to do his first presentation, then we'll have another one after that, and then we'll open to panel for questions. So Eric, would you like to share your presentation? Thanks very much, Alistair. Um, and uh, hello to everyone from Denmark. Uh, I will uh, just uh, share my screen to get started. Does this work? Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes, we can see your screen. And for those um, who, if you double click on the presentation that Eric's just put up, you'll be able to see it in a larger scale. Okay. So uh, again, hello everyone. My name is uh, Eric Kier from the Center for, for uh, Global Cooperation at the Danish Energy Agency. Um, Many thanks to, to GWEC for organizing this uh, quite a groundbreaking virtual event uh, and, and for the invitation to speak. Uh, I will, so uh, today I'm going to give you an insight into the ongoing uh, work with uh, IRIA uh, to provide uh, some of the experiences and inputs uh, that we have uh, harvested over 30 years of offshore uh, wind development in Denmark. Um, and so we're very excited to contribute uh, to starting uh, a new offshore industry in Vietnam. Um, we are supporting IRIA in several uh, areas, uh, all within the energy arena, of course, but, um, and we've been doing that for, for quite some time now, since 2013. Uh, some of our flagship uh, products of, of this uh, are the Energy Outlook reports, uh, and, and there's the front page of, uh, of the latest one uh, published uh, last year. Uh, and, and last year also uh, brought a, a request from IRIA to, to work more on the, uh, on the offshore side of things um, with uh, a scope that would be a resource estimate and uh, some inputs to uh, developing a roadmap uh, uh, in, in Vietnam uh, for this. So we have uh, we, we contracted a consultancy called Kobe to do part of the work, which is why some of the slides will be marked uh, with their name. And today I would like to take you through some of the preliminary results. It will be a quick flyover due to the time uh, limits. Um, I also wanted to say that um, 
Iria has kindly given us uh, their permission to share uh, what you see here today. Um, so uh, we're very happy uh, for that. So, uh, the scope of uh, what we're currently uh, in, in what we're currently involved with uh, are, are these topics uh, on the screen right now. Um, these are some intertwined topics. Uh, Sorry. So uh, these are the topics that that we are looking into, uh, and and these are the topics agreed with every year. Um, and as I was saying, these are intertwined topics, uh, but should form the basis for uh, a good discussion uh, at at the Vietnamese government side of, of things. Um, and obviously, uh, the uh, some of the key things here are clear bold long-term targets that will send clear investment signals to the supply chain, but also to education, institutions, and so forth. Um, the, um, you will mention, or you will notice that uh, the potential for, uh, for offshore wind is, is uh, mentioned uh, here on the list, and, uh, and I will come back to that uh, shortly. I would also state that uh, when we started out uh, with this process with EREA, there was a, a vision of, or, or an idea of creating a Southeast Asian hub for offshore wind in Vietnam. And, uh, and I think that was a very uh, foresighted uh, way of attacking this, um, uh, this new uh, technology. Next slide, please. So, this is a busy slide. Um, let me start with the technical potential. Um, what we have done is we've done a, a desk study. Uh, so, based on available uh, resources, uh, we have looked at uh, we have looked at bottom fixed and we have looked at floating offshore. Uh, the bottom fixed uh, from five kilometers offshore to 100 kilometers uh, uh, offshore uh, and water depth up to 55 uh, meters. Um, for the floating, uh, we have looked at, at uh, distances more than 10 kilometers from shore and less than 100 and water depth above 55 meters and less than 1000 meters. And we came up with um, uh, some numbers here, uh, 37,000 square kilometers uh, fulfill the criteria for the bottom fixed, whereas 25,000 square kilometers uh, fulfill the criteria for floating. Um, and when we look at uh, the, the, the wind resource and, and uh, at, the, at the various sites, we have come up with this uh, potential for uh, floating and bottom fixed combined of 160 gigawatts. It's what we call a technical potential and there will be some of the sites that will be excluded if you go closer uh, and do more planning uh, on, uh, on these sites. Um, I don't know if the size allows you to see in, in much detail, but on the middle uh, uh, graph, you, you can see the location of the, of the sites. Um, and um, what we have also done is we have ranked the sites according to LCOE um, based on a preliminary grid uh, analysis that has assumed a one by one connection so far. So we have assumed every possible uh, site to be a 500 megawatt site. And then we have looked at, with some good assistance from the Institute of Energy, we have looked at, uh, at the costs of connecting a 500 megawatt uh, wind farm to the nearest grid connection point or onshore and so forth. Uh, and um, and you will see uh, a ranking of, um, of, of the LCOE numbers uh, ranging from 81 um, uh, euros per megawatt hour, so 
yeah, one should note this is in euros, and then up to uh, around 120 for the bottom fixed. Um, I should mention here that this is a preliminary uh, grid study, and we are currently working on looking at the cumulative effects on, on the grid costs uh, uh, because there's uh, obviously a, a larger number and these will impact each other's uh, in terms of cost when you start connecting a huge amount of, um, of offshore wind. So this was just a flavor of some of the things that, that we have spent a lot of time on. And, uh, and uh, if you go to the next slide, Li Ming, Let me highlight again uh, the necessity for clear and long-term and, uh, you know, uh, hopefully broad-based uh, uh, targets for, for this industry. This is really something that we have experienced in, in Denmark, that, that, that robust and long-term policies uh, are, are instrumental to creating uh, sound industrial development. Um, and also, uh, as mentioned in previous sessions, the de-risking element is, is, is something that we have worked a lot on in Denmark, which is instrumental in getting prices down and, you know, achieving uh, a, a good and sound learning curve. Um, yeah, there is a distinct first mover uh, advantage, uh, I think, for, for, for Vietnam. Uh, also because uh, they are among the first in, in the region, but it, it's, it's, uh, timing is really important in, in this. Right, my next real slide will take you through the uh, recommendations, um, and please change uh, to the next. Yeah, thank you, Li Ming. So for, for those of you, and many of you have been around in this industry in, in, in many, many years, there, there's hardly any surprises uh, to this list. Um, but what we have done is we have uh, suggested a vision of 20, there are 10 gigawatt of offshore wind by 2030. Uh, and, uh, and this is sort of uh, one of the things that we have based our uh, learning curve uh, discussions uh, on. Uh, and on this background, uh, we find that what is important now is to set out these clear long-term progressive targets. We talked about that. It's important to designate a government lead nodal agency to front uh, the, uh, the permitting and consenting of offshore wind uh, projects and to act it's as a one-stop right. shop so uh, a one-stop shop, hopefully, uh, that could contribute to streamlining the, the permitting and the, and, and, and the consenting, both at the central level, but also, uh, importantly, at the provincial levels. And we are proposing that uh, Vietnam initiates a uh, zoning of areas for offshore wind developments, uh, meaning that um, they consider uh, targets, uh, look at LCOE trends, spatial requirements, uh, maritime uh, constraints, ports, harbors, uh, of course, grid connection issues, and also uh, start uh, a dialogue with the provincial governments on how do they best roll out this, uh, this new industry. Um, and then uh, we are also suggesting that uh, Vietnam considers kickstarting the sector through the award of uh, uh, very large uh, uh, demonstration projects. It's, it's kind of a strange word, but very large scale uh, initial uh, projects um, in the gigawatt scale uh, and award these uh, through perhaps more of a negotiated procedure or leaning on uh, on on uh, existing uh, frameworks, um, but but importantly, the price uh, for 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 the power should be uh, at a level that attracts uh, significant market interest. And here we heard about it already. The a bankable power purchase agreement uh, is necessary before these. Uh, contracts are awarded, uh, and in 
in close consultation with uh, project developers and lenders. And, um, and then, of course, uh, looking at the supply chain, there needs to be a skill gaps uh, assessment and uh, uh, you would have to to see how you could build up uh, competences rather rapidly in, in this area. We're also, we're also recommending that Vietnam looks at an organic uh, build up of the uh, supply chain uh, rather than uh, recommend or rather than uh, putting out some hard local content requirements. And then there's uh, a bullet point on the integration, uh, the design uh, uh, standards and, and the certification in here. We think it is uh, absolutely essential to build on international best practices um, to also ensure that prices come down and, and you don't uh, invent something that will go the other way and drive up prices. And then uh, we recommend that the Chinese government uh, draws up some cost reduction trajectory scenarios and try to understand the long-term benefits that this industry can bring to, uh, to Vietnam. Um, uh, not only in terms of, of, of jobs, but of course also in terms of how this can really contribute significantly to uh, the power system in, in Vietnam and how you can integrate this, the, all this power in, in, a, in a good and economical uh, way. Yes, how am I doing on time, uh, uh, Alastair? Yeah. But so you're overrunning a bit. If you could um, okay, no. draw Next to a close, slide. That'd be great. Yeah, I will draw this to a close now. The Next slide is just um, I hope. Yes, uh, we are hoping that we will be in a position to come to Hanoi uh, on the 9th of September, uh, 2020. Uh, the COVID situation allowing to, to give uh, a presentation of the report and its recommendations uh, at a workshop including EREA and, and the provincial stakeholders, MOIT, uh, etc. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, very insightful. Um, we also have with us uh, Key from the World Bank, and um, he appears on screen as Ravin, but that's uh, just an editing issue. So welcome, Key. I know you had some difficulty getting into the session, um, and I invite you to um, make your presentation. Li Ming will share the slides. Thank you, Alastair. And, uh... Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so it's my uh, uh, pleasure to be with you, you know, to have some good discussion. And I try to present our group with MYT uh, to support the government of Vietnam to uh, develop some kind of roadmap for of the winning Vietnam. So can you hear me or is there uh, some technical problem? We can hear you fine. Key. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Um, so for all, you know, um, I would like to introduce a little bit about our our uh, our program. So, the work uh, we are working in Vietnam is part of the uh, the One Bank Group uh, global uh, program, uh, which is managed by by the World Bank, IFC, and and ESMO. And the main objective uh, objective of the program is you know to promote the offshore win in the emerging markets. And you know we work with uh, you know a wide range of stakeholder and partner including uh, the global green uh, energy cautions, right? So uh, the program uh, scope of work is, you know, basically cover both, you know, upstream and downstream work, uh, covering both the knowledge uh, generation exchange, and so on the market, develop support and system, and, you know, even go down to the project specific, we can help the, um, the client to do some kind of the project uh, preparation work. And Vietnam is uh, one of the, uh, the highest zero you know, priority countries that you know program is aimed for because you know uh, the, the the good potential of the offshore in Vietnam also 
because of the strong commitment provided by the government to the to this program. Um, so let's come back to the our our program in Vietnam. Um, because you, you know that you know also green um, uh, business is a long term investment. That's why you know when we when we when we work in Vietnam and we think that we need to develop a very long term vision to Vietnam uh, by you know uh, in our study it up to, to 2050. And basically the vision have to help the government Vietnam to answer you know three main uh, basic questions. Uh, the first one is that you know why Opsa Win is uh, so uh, uh, important for Vietnam and why Vietnam should pursue Opsa Win development. The second uh, question would be what is the best gain for uh, Opsa Win in Vietnam? You know, taking into account the uh, the demand of the country about the Opsa Win potential, about the international market development, and so on, to come up with you know the best. Uh, scenario for Vietnam, you know how they can benefit from the uh, offshore wind potential, and, and and third one is that if Vietnam going ahead with the offshore wind, what the benefits Vietnam can obtain from that? Not you know, and our study is not limited within Vietnam, but but try to to see if Vietnam make effort to participate in the international markets, what is the benefit Vietnam can get? So. That is the, the way. Uh, that is the way we start with our study, and once we answer through the question and create the visions, uh, we um, uh, go to the next step. It you know to prepare some kind of the uh, the, the, the 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 measure or, or, or actions uh, or next step, how to materialize the the, the vision and try to help Vietnam to um, to implement um, the visions, and our work is focusing on about the how to enable um, uh, a good uh, framework in, ter in terms of leasing, permitting, about procurement and other issues, and also on the in, uh, enabling the infrastructure that required for Vietnam to implement the program. So that is the, 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 the approach or the way we, we develop the roadmap in Vietnam. Um, and I mentioned earlier that you know we look on the long-term versions, and we try to create the two scenario. We call the low uh, grow uh, and high growth scenario, where we project you know uh, the the scale of the also in, Viet uh, in Vietnam. And you, you can see that you know um, for in, in in screen that you know for the for the high growth scenario, we project that you know the also in capacity. By 2030, it's about 10 gigawatts. By 2040, it's about 40 gigawatts. And by 2050, it will be 70 gigawatts. The low growth scenario is, is, uh, is a bit lower than the high growth, but you can see that in any um, scenario, the also will, will play a quite significant proportion of the power generation, uh, power, uh, generation mix in Vietnam. Uh, <clears throat> And you can see that, you know, um, oh, I think we start. Uh, you can see that uh, from this slide, you, you can see that, you know, in terms of technologies, um, um, you, you can see that, you know, the, the, um, the, uh, the, fixed, uh, the fixed foundation technology will play an important role in Vietnam in very uh, first state of, of, the, of the roadmap. But later, later, later on, the um, the, the uh, floating uh, technology will have to bring in to make sure that the Vietnam can can obtain or can achieve the the, the, the targets. Um, and I mentioned that we have a two uh, scenario, and um, uh, and we can see that you know. Um, we try to estimate the what the benefit for Vietnam, uh, what the value added that Vietnam can get from the the the, the two scenario, and uh, our calculation uh, show that you know for the high uh, growth scenario, we uh, Vietnam can uh, can obtain about 50 billion uh, US dollars between 2020 to 2035, and why in the lower um, uh, growth scenario. The, the value uh, obtained could be lower about uh, 13 uh, billion US dollars. And please note that the difference between the two scenario, scenario is not just 
uh, because of the uh, difference in the scale of offshore wind could be installed in Vietnam, but also uh, from other, um, uh, how say the, 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 the other, the difference between the, the level of the Vietnam uh, can provide, can, can, can participate in the production chain yeah, and, and, and so on. For example, in the, in the high growth scenario, we, ex we expect that, you know, 40% of the value added that Vietnam can gain is through the export the products and other services to, to outside Vietnam rather than, you know, the, 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 the Vietnam markets. Um, and a similar in terms of operation, you know, our uh, study also um, shown that, you know, Vietnam can have a, a very good op op opportunities to create a, a lot of jobs throughout all the state of the, uh, of the project developments. For example, in our uh, this uh, calculation estimate that you know about several thousand of the full-time equivalent years will be created between 2020 and 2035. So, in the short, you can see that Vietnam can have a lot of can uh, can can benefit a lot of, of the programs um, uh, through throughout the, the the program, and it very much depend on which scenario that that, that Vietnam want, want to uh, want to go ahead. Um, uh, in addition to, to that, you know, we, um, Vietnam also had to pay attention about some, to upgrade some kind of the infrastructure um, facility, for example, about transmission upgrades, about the port um, uh, and, 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 and a sort of uh, uh, structure to support the, um, the program. So, uh, uh, in terms of conclusion and, and next step, um, uh, I think that you know, and I think that, and, and I think that you know, Vietnam have very very good potential for for offshore wind developments, and it have a capacity and also have a um, I'll say the facility uh, existing that can be used to utilize the offshore wind potential, and offshore wind can uh, you know deliver a lot of the economics and uh, environmental benefit for Vietnam. Um, first of all, in, in materialize the, 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 um, the roadmap, I think that the, the, the more important thing for Vietnam right now is that they have to endorse a long-term vision and clear volume targets, it, because it's very important to send a message to investors to commit the long-term uh, commitment of the government of Vietnam to, um, to the industry so that you know, the investor can have a confidence to invest in the project and try to develop some kind of the local uh, industry and also production chain uh, in, in Vietnam. Um, the second issue is that Vietnam should uh, uh, pay attention to streamline the leasing and permitting procedures um, to make it more transparent and clear to the old investor, not only for the local but also for the investor. Uh, and, and I mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, the, the government also want had to uh, strengthening the uh, transmission uh, system and the ports um, to support the, the, this kind of developments. Um, in terms of the um, our our time schedule, uh, we have exceptional report ready, and we hope that you know the consultation with the government and other stakeholder would be conducted sometime in June 2020s uh, and and July 2020s. And then uh, we can have uh, the final report uh, or a roadmap submitted to the government for endorsement sometime in fall of 2020. So, um, so that is you know very uh, very uh, brief about our work. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, we're happy for any question and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Key. Um, <clears throat> if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, that will help people. Uh, connect thank yeah. you um so we as i said at the beginning we have a, a very fine panel of people who know a lot of things and they're going to share that with you now um i'll ask them to uh introduce themselves and in two minutes answer is vietnam the next offshore wind market in asia mary would you like to take us away there's a challenge to do that in two minutes um thanks alistair um so MHI Investors, we're um, just to introduce our business quickly. We're the world's only pure play offshore wind turbine manufacturer. We employ around about just over 3,000 people 
worldwide. And we are a product of a joint venture between Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and Vestas. So Asia Pacific market is not, not a new, new market for us. And we already as MHI Vestas have strong feet in Taiwan and Japan. And so we're, very, we're really excited about the opportunity in Vietnam. And um, I think we have a great deal of experience we can contribute as the market, um, market continues to develop. Um, is it the next big market in Asia? I think I'll perhaps address at least two of the things that have been mentioned in the presentation and perhaps offer a little bit of friendly advice from a turbine OEM perspective at the end. I think at the risk of violently agreeing with Eric and Kai, I think long-term targets and policy and clear cost reduction and ramp up targets are absolutely key. And we've seen the value of those in Europe and how they how they drive a market and drive drive costs down for the consumer as well. And I think for Vietnam, that means some real clarity from the authorities around how those early projects will be brought forward, but also those projects that we expect to come into the um, National Power Development Plan 8 in the coming, in the coming years. For a uh, turbine OEM, that means those kind of long-term targets mean that we can invest, invest in facilities or be part of the um, program for our suppliers to do so. These kind of facilities and industrial plan, they're not built overnight. So we need a long, a long view of what the pipeline will be. So we and others can make our investments and payback periods, but also as we touched on, train our workforce in the right way and also make sure we pass um, global certifications in the market as well, which is really crucial for an industry that has such a focus on, on safety. And all of those things lead to a sustainable market for the long term, not just a market that comes for a few years and then disappears again. I'll also, also strongly agree with Eric about organic build out of the supply chain. I think again, back to Europe where we've seen the most successful markets, um, the requirements on the supply chain have either been minimal or very flexible and developed in partnership with the industry and not imposed, imposed top down. I think we've seen that particularly in one of our home markets, Denmark, but also Germany, the Netherlands, and also the UK, the UK as well. And that all feeds into a sustainable market in the long term if it's allowed to build build organically. I think perhaps to offer, offer perhaps a little bit of advice and stop agreeing so much with what, um, what was just said in the presentations, I think for, the Viet for Vietnam, I think the authorities need to be clear and quite quickly on what the strategic plan for offshore wind and the industrial, the industrial plan is. I think we all know how fast the world, the world is moving and how fast the offshore wind market is moving both in Asia Pacific and globally. I think um, Developers and manufacturers such as ourselves, we have the opportunity now to put our resources in a number of different markets. And the more quickly we see clarity in markets, that obviously makes those more attractive for us. And I think also for the Vietnam, Vietnamese authorities, I think we also need support from them. So how can they support their suppliers to develop? What support can they give for developing infrastructure, developing facilities, developing workforces? Developing the supply chains done in partnership with the authorities rather than having something imposed top down. So we'd certainly welcome the opportunity for a dialogue about how we can work work together to develop a, develop a supply chain. I think that partnership is really, really crucial, particularly in a um, very competitive um, cost driven cost driven market as well. So I think Vietnam has huge opportunity, but I think we need to work in collaboration with the authorities to do that quickly. So I'll ask uh, Maya to answer the same question. How are you doing? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Good, good. Uh, yeah, we're um, we're really positive about the prospects for offshore wind in Vietnam. So all the fundamentals are there: good wind resource, uh, long coastline, uh, strong and increasing power demand, um, and um, yeah, and you know there will be a supply crunch. So. Uh, we are kind of offering a, a good solution on the supply side um, for the challenges ahead. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not problem free. Um, there are issues to be solved around the policy and the tariff and um, uh, the transparency on the consenting side and financeability of PPA. But these are also not uncommon. So um, we, we were here in, in Taiwan from the early days, um, developing offshore wind projects and also seeing these as well as, well as other issues through. So um, 
yeah they 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 can be solved with the with the right uh support um particularly from government side so yeah generally we're very optimistic and um i guess it's demonstrated by the fact that we have just opened an office so we're actively pursuing opportunities in vietnam so we definitely see a future very good thank you hans how are you doing with your audio I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Now. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. Yeah, actually, I, um, uh, let me also briefly uh, say a couple of words to WP before I answer your question. Um, uh, we are a, a privately owned uh, group of companies uh, with a headquarter in Bremen in Germany and active in the onshore, offshore, and PV sector since more than 25 years. Um, we are covering uh, basically the entire value chain from greenfield uh, uh, project development over financing construction to, uh, all the way to the operation of uh, of projects and, um, yeah we, currently we are building uh, taiwan's first big uh, commercial offshore wind project uh, the yunlin 640 megawatt uh, project uh, and uh, yeah, we we obviously are very keen to build uh, up on this uh, the success and this experience also in in Vietnam, and jointly move uh, the Vietnamese offshore industry uh, forward. Um, how do we how do we see the Vietnamese uh, offshore industry? Obviously, uh, I think looking on the figures uh, which were presented by Eric and and uh, Key, I think uh, the, the potential is definitely there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, um, as also mentioned before, there is also uh, some kind of petition for, uh, for, for the supply chain, but also for uh, um, financing. And, and obviously, we see other markets like Taiwan, uh, Japan, Korea, obviously also mainland China, uh, are moving, moving forward uh, very quickly. So, so I think if, uh, if one would, uh, would like to, to see the offshore industry, uh, um, also moving into Vietnam, uh, I think, uh, yeah, we uh, some some tasks need, also need to be uh, fulfilled. And, and as mentioned before uh, by Maya and, and the presenters, uh, I think uh, one very important topic for for us as developers is a clear and transparent um, uh, uh, framework, legal framework uh, on which uh, we can, uh, yeah, uh, on which we can develop our projects. Obviously, clear, uh, uh, clear and broken down targets um, by uh, by the policy uh, what uh, what kind of capacity can be expected uh, within defined um, uh, yeah, time frames uh, and uh, and last but, last but not least obviously the the right incentives to to do the uh, the first uh, first investments and and I think a lot of uh, good ideas and um, and uh, yeah, activities uh, can be seen right now now, but uh, but uh, there are also remaining some. Uh, there there remain also some uh, some issues to be solved. Very good, thank you, Bernard. You've been working in Vietnam for a little while. What are your views to the question of whether Vietnam is the next offshore wind market in Asia? Hello, Hi, Alistair. Yes, thanks for the the question, um, Bernard Casey here, uh, mainstream renewable power. Um, I guess. Um, We've been in the country for two years now, and uh, our flagship project here is the uh, is an 800 megawatt target capacity offshore wind project, uh, being developed jointly with uh, with our local partner, the Fukuong Group, um, in Sokchang Province. Um, and I guess in this period, we've uh, we've learned quite a lot about the fledging offshore wind industry in Vietnam. I I share the views of the the panel about um, the fundamentals. I think in March this year, MOIT produced um, a letter now known as Letter 1931, which gave a very good good overview of the the, the energy market in Vietnam from looking forward to 2030 on both the supply and demand side. And we see that in 2024-25, there's a serious risk of power shortages driven largely by um, the stalled and cancelled coal-fired power plants so there's an opportunity for offshore wind to fill that gap and um between in the discussions between moit and government they've 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 set out a, a very plausible first step of expansion of pdp7 with offshore wind projects 
and secondly PDP8. So we're we're very confident that um, there's a number of steps being taken in government that uh, will facilitate offshore wind and. I guess um, to Eric's point earlier, first mover advantage in the market will be important, and we we uh, aspire that our project in in Sok Chang, which will start construction next year, will be the first uh, truly offshore wind power from project from offshore wind in Vietnam. Very good, thank you. And we've had some questions coming in, and uh, one of those is particularly on the subject of local content. Um, there seems to be a debate as to how much there should be or whether there should be. Mary, I believe you have some views on this. I do, and I'm just reading through the um, the messages that have come come online. I think the point, I think both Eric and I were making, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, is that completely understand and appreciate the um, the need to drive it and actually comments right in the longer term. Um, it does make sense for a country to have its own supply chain, a supply chain that it has good experience that it should develop the competencies in the areas it knows it's good at. So for example, in the UK, we have great competence in operations and maintenance and the legal eco environmental assessment ecosystem that sits around, sits around the industry. We're not so great in the UK at, at the moment, manufacturing, um, foundation manufacturing or steel, perhaps that's something more for the, more for the Asia specific markets. It makes sense for countries to develop their own supply chain that they're good at, but also appreciating they sit in a global global marketplace. And frankly, manufacturers can't put factories in all markets. We'll put them where they make sense and are most competitive. Very good. And I'll just add to that. I mean, Europe has been successful because it's a region, a regional market, not a country by country market. And exactly. at GWIC, we see the same dynamic happening in Asia. Um, so everybody will get a piece of the pie. Very good. Yeah. Does anybody else want to jump in on local content? Eric. I, I just wanted to emphasize that Vietnam actually has a very uh, good starting point in some areas. Uh, and, and there is a, a, a local a tower manufacturing industry which has uh, thousands of jobs already. So, uh, so there are uh, very good competences to build on uh, in, in this area. Very good. Alistair, maybe I could maybe add to Eric's point there. Um, I guess um, we've seen that uh, uh, a lot of the early wind projects, offshore wind projects in, in Vietnam that are coming will be in relatively shallow waters. And um, in our development of our project in Sok Chang, we've, we've, uh, we've built two offshore platforms and we've used local um, contractors to uh, uh, evaluate the capability to install, for example, offshore piling uh, to work in the intertidal areas. And um, I have to say, we've been very impressed. Um, when it comes to larger scale offshore work, we've got uh, big uh, companies like Vietso Petro, who have experience with, with jacket fabrication for um, oil and gas facilities and have have been actively uh, talking to developers around um, being able to scale up to produce uh, foundations at scale and they had they have a particular interest in tripods so uh, i mean we've, we've we've had very credible submissions from uh, vietnamese um contractors on our project yes yeah, so, I mean, vietnam's uh, lucky it's got a substantial oil and gas industry and certainly the work uh, in the world bank uh, study, which is um, still only, it's, it's not finished yet, but the port infrastructure is really impressive. Um, this is unlike many other countries. So um, I think Vietnam's got a, a great opportunity. We've also got some questions on the uh, subject of levelized cost of energy and what is the biggest initiative that can be done now to reduce the LCOE. Um, Hans, why don't you take it? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, in a certain way, it uh, relates uh, also to, to what has been mentioned before. I think, first of all, uh, if there are clear build out targets, clear, uh, clear goals, how uh, investments um, uh, yeah, can be utilized and uh, not only in the supply chain, but uh, um, but but uh, 
also from on, on a developer side i think um, that would uh, would be one one of the most important uh, things at the beginning to say okay we have a clear uh, clear target how ma how many megawatts can be built how many uh, monopiles do we need uh, during the next five to ten years how many jacket structures um, can be produced uh, and uh, and i think that's that's very important otherwise um, obviously all these investments in the manufacturing plants and so on will need to be borne by uh, by single projects uh, which uh, which will definitely not uh, not bring down uh, uh, the the costs and maya well, what's your view on this what 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 will most yeah. mostly drive down levelized cost of energy quite similar to hans actually i really the best thing you can do is um is give scale um through through scale you will uh, attract um big suppliers and link to local content as well and you'll just see a stronger establishment um of uh, developers and suppliers on a local level and you will see just see the direct and also indirect benefits for both cost of energy um as well as local content um without uh, forcing it through because the, the natural incentives are actually already there for developers to pursue those things. Very good. Um, can I ask Bernard, uh, what the consenting process, you're, you're in that at the moment, what are your thoughts on how that could develop? Yeah, so I think the consenting process in Vietnam um, is followed uh, the the onshore process is followed it's very similar to the offshore process so is that the uh, there's been very little tailoring of the offshore consenting process for offshore um and um i think um to eric's point earlier around having a one-stop consenting shop i think that's that that makes for a huge amount of sense so at the moment um there's a number of permitting stages to an offshore wind project in Vietnam and both the, prov the province has a role and central government has a role and within central government um, Monray, the Ministry for Natural Resources um, have a have a significant role and um, this is being addressed um, in terms of there's one particular topic that I think a lot of developers are, have been struggling to get their head around is what they call the sea assignment rights um, which is a, a process that is now being incorporated into the EIA process in in Vietnam, which is a very positive development. Um, so I guess uh, improving, but um, more work needed to do to produce a bespoke offshore consenting process. Right. Mary, um, on the, I meant to ask you about cost reductions uh, topic as well as being in the supply chain, you will have views relation to how we see cost reduction, the pressure, I mean, the pressure we're being put on? Is that your question? No, but more as to what would, what's your advice to Vietnam uh, government on driving cost reduction down? I uh, understand. I think using some, based on some of the experience we've seen in other markets, particularly the UK, I think set, set a clear target and support industry to get there. I think in the UK, in the 2012, 2011, 2012, industry and government together set a target that by 2020, we'd be at 100 pounds a meg megawatt hour. And actually, industry worked very closely together. There was a framework put in place, and actually, we hit that a few years, a few years early. And as people will know, far, far below those prices. Today. So I think it comes back to that idea of clear, long term, and visible targets that don't change. And then also a strong collaboration with industry to meet, to hit those targets. Very good. And um, sorry, back to um, I think Maya this time in terms of the consenting process. You've been working in Taiwan as well. What's your observation um, of the Vietnam process? Um. Uh, yeah, in a way, uh, a lot of uh, similarities. Um, so I would say uh, equally as complex in uh, in Vietnam compared to Taiwan, and perhaps a um, little less transparent. But also because it, it's a it's a new industry, 
And um, yes, uh, structurally, there's no dedicated um, regulation on offshore wind. So we are very much going with what has been common practice combined with you know, regulation from other renewables and uh, infrastructure areas. Um, and yeah, I think in a way, particularly for early projects, um, we uh, we can see it's not so straightforward to try to get regulation changed. Um, but um, I think a lot can be done if you get enough support at, at a high uh, government level to um, to help regulators to cope with you know, how to apply their regulation to something that doesn't fit in the box, because this tends to be what causes the delays. So actually, that's what we are advocating for, to um, set up an office. And I think Eric suggested something similar mm -hmm. that is essentially tasked to support um, yeah, helping to, to push uh, offshore wind projects through current framework and then in the medium to longer term, you know, get the, the regulation change so it supports the industry and can make things more efficient. Thank you, Mai. Uh, Hans, WPD are well known for entering markets early. So um, what's your thoughts on the process, the consenting process at the moment? Yeah, I mean, um, let me give uh, give an example how 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 important I think the transparency and clarity on the on the consenting uh, process is. Um, I think one market we are currently uh, working on is also Japan. So let let aside Taiwan. I think Japan is uh, is one of the examples where where we had for a long time a very high feed-in tariff, um, thirty six uh, Japanese yen, which, uh, which uh, sounds initially very attractive, but there was no legislation uh, available how to to really get uh, long-term permits uh, in the general sea and so uh, so within the last uh, last nearly 10 years no uh, no um, yeah commercial scale offshore wind park has been built and only now uh, while um, uh, while the government is putting uh, or has put together some uh, some initial legal framework i think the the offshore market is really gaining momentum and uh, and gaining speed and and i think uh, that should be kept in mind uh, in discussing um, uh, the financial incentives, feed-in tariffs. Uh, that uh, at the end, for for getting your your financing done, getting your your projects done, uh, there needs to be clarity on uh, on the permitting and the licensing uh, procedures. And I think uh, in that that respect, uh, we see a lot of progress on the onshore wind side in Vietnam. Uh, but uh, but uh, we we see also um, and we see some initial uh, moves in on the offshore wind. But I think uh, there, there there obviously remains some work. And and as Maya said, I think we as developers are always uh, willing uh, and and very interested to support also the the policymakers. Very good, thank you. We also have another question from the audience um, uh, from Vishnu who asks, how does the EPC contracting strategy differ in the offshore wind sector compared to the oil and gas industry? Bernard, might I ask you that question? Sure, Alistair. I'm not sure if I'll have um, a definitive answer, but um, I guess we've been, we've been testing the market here um, in terms of a likely strategy for our project um, with a, a new offshore wind market like Vietnam and potentially comes some concerns with um, PPA, uh, we'd look to have uh, a strategy that would have minimal uh, contracts. So um, we've inquired to the OEMs around uh, the appetite for a full EPC wrap. And uh, I guess Mary may, may have on that. Um, we have had some interest in a full EPC wrap uh, from some turbine suppliers. Um, and of course, with an EPC wrap, you, the, the price has to work, uh, of course, with the tariff and the financial model. Um, in the offshore, in the oil and gas industry in Vietnam, um, again, from our engagement with some of the big oil and gas players, um, there are some very big engineering organizations within the oil and gas uh 
uh, companies in Vietnam like like Vietso Petro, as I mentioned, um, where they in house they will design jackets, they'll they'll fabricate jackets for oil and gas rigs, so um, and they'll subcontract to uh, for smaller external components. So um, I've seen a number of questions coming up on the uh, on the the stream there around oil and gas uh, being different to offshore wind, and that's a very valid comment. Um, but I think, like in Europe, uh, the oil and gas uh, groups in Vietnam are are looking to offshore wind, maybe to rescue them in the future, to reinvent themselves. Um, oil and gas has a limited future, and uh, and these big teams are of, of skilled offshore engineers are looking to upskill, and cost will be very important. They've they've been able to operate perhaps at 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 um, cost levels that can't be sustained by offshore wind. So that'll be a challenge. Mary, did you have a view? Bernard passed you the baton. Did. Um, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to comment on contracts and strategies directly, but just to make a few points about the wider oil and gas transition. I think there's huge opportunity there. And as Bernard said, it's, um, this transition is coming our way and perhaps sooner, sooner than many anticipated after COVID as well. I think one thing from a manufacturing side to watch for is that it's not necessarily a case of many it's like, oh, we did manufacture that component, we'll just and our requirements are very different. Our requirements in terms of health and safety and quality are very different. And I think probably the most important thing to remember is actually we're a serial manufacturing environment. And actually when oil and gas companies sometimes come to us and say, oh, we can make one of those a month, we say, no, 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 we need we need three or four a week. And so those requirements are actually very different to what a lot of um, com manufacturing companies in oil and gas are used to. And this comes back to the point of the industry needs to be developed in collaboration with the supply chain and also with um, government and the authorities as well. Yeah, so I, I uh, echo your thoughts, Mary, in terms of this is going to happen faster. In fact, in the last month, I presented at two uh, virtual workshops in Aberdeen. Uh, companies who are very interested to come into the offshore wind sector. So many have already, but there's more to come. So um, this transition looks like it's speeding up, which is good. Eric, um, what's your thoughts on oil and gas uh, coming into offshore wind? Well, I think uh, we, we have some experience from Europe indicating that uh, there are different characteristics in the offshore industry and, and that you, uh, if you just adopt uh, uh, the standards and the procedures used in the oil and gas, you will press uh, prices up uh, far too, too high. Um, but having said that, I, I think there are uh, quite some skills that are transferable over time uh, in the educational system, uh, the supply chain, etc. Very good. Um, Singang Zhang, uh, welcome back. Hi. Um, uh, <laughs> Finally. I have a last question for just for you. Yes. Um, what are the similarities between China and Vietnam from a technology point of view in offshore wind? Yeah, of course, as we can see from from the seasonal and the empire, environmental scenarios, we, we see a lot of similarities between the Chinese offshore mar market, you know, uh, as well as the Vietnam uh, market, especially when we considering, uh, uh, I, I just heard Eric said, as well as Ravi said, by 2013, we will have 10 gigawatt and by 2015 we will have 70 even if it if it's a floating is included we will have we will hit 160 that's wow so uh by doing this comparing for for, for chinese offshore wind you know uh, for for china we started our first uh, pilot uh, installation uh, it was uh, back in almost uh, 12 years ago done by a gold one and uh, uh, you can see along the Chinese coast, uh, together with the uh, Vietnam coast, uh, we are all experiencing, uh, first of all, the, the wind speed, the average the wind speed are not that high compared to what we will see in the North Sea. They are just around 7 meters per second to maybe 8 per second uh, 
um, eight meters per second at the southern part of the Vietnam coast. So therefore, if we talk about the, the wind resources, we have a lot of similarities to this to discuss and uh, comparing the the sea sea environment. And uh, what I can see is that uh, if we're talking about uh, the wave heights, the wave period, as well as the tide, we will have more or less the same. And uh, if we are talking about uh, the, let's see, the, 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 the soil conditions, we all have time, uh, we all have some kind of, you can call it uh, intertidal uh, zoom, which China has a lot of experience in this area. So if we see from the resource, the natural resource point of view, we see a lot of similarities uh, between Vietnam and China. Yeah. Very good. And uh, sorry, keep going. Yeah. If we, if we talk about from the point of view in terms of uh, turbine technologies, you know, uh, I am from Goldwind, so we would like to talk more about the turbine turbine technologies. And since we are all in the Asia Pacific Ocean area, therefore, uh, when we're talking about the, the salt, the, the salt, as well as those uh, uh, those. Uh, especially for salt, we, we see, we talk about uh, corrosion. Uh, it, you know, at the moment, when I uh, look at the Vietnam market, when I talk to the people there, I am strongly feeling that people there are quite uh, curious about, wow, what the corrosion uh, scenario is in Vietnam? What kind of corrosion uh, problem we will, we will face? And this is much, much similar to what we have uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, you know, back to those days, when for Go the Goldwyn, for example, when we are doing our first or the first pilot, when we're doing our first uh, uh, demonstrational wind farm, we are thinking about the same. You know, it's not about uh, just the uh, uh, technical issues. We are, you know, the, the Vietnam people and the Chinese people, people are in this industry are facing the same scenario that uh, growing, what a growing is. So we are facing the same problems and th those kind of feeling when we face to those unknown issues, I believe uh, the Chinese uh, people working in that uh, area can provide some help to the Vietnam market. Yeah. Very good. So uh, from this discussion, I conclude the positive uh, view on uh, for offshore wind in Vietnam, which is great, uh, both for Vietnam and the wider industry. I'm going to draw this session to a close. Could I thank all the speakers uh, and the panelists for some excellent uh, input? And for everybody online, can you just give everybody a clap? Because I think <laughs> I think that's what they did. <laughs> okay. 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 Back over to you, Alita. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alistair. Um, so that wraps up the offshore sen session. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, Zhang uh, Zhang from Goldwyn had some connection issues. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about Goldwyn, they have a booth in the virtual expo um, that will be open a bit later um, in, for the conference program. Um, so now we will have the business matchmaking session. Um, uh, you can go to that if you go back to the sessions area that is now open and you can join us there to hear from some local Vietnamese developers. Um, so I'd ask everyone to now move over to that session now and I'll, I'll see you there shortly. And thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.